All right, let's see here. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So, uh, is it working? I think it is. Hopefully, everyone can see this and let me hide my floating bar. We're all getting really adept at this during COVID, right? <laughs> Okay, so I think we're we're all sharing, we're all seeing this now. Okay, so to talk about myrmecophiles, these special little creatures, we first need to understand how an ant colony works. Many of you probably are already really familiar, but an ant colony is a family of ants. It's made up of one or multiple queens, which are the egg-laying females, and a lot of sterile or non-reproductive daughters that cooperate to divide all of the other tasks uh, of the colony, such as nest maintenance, brood care, and foraging. The way that these societies are organized are shaped by the ecology of the environments where they live. And with more than 14,000 different ant species, that really means that there are more than 14,000 different types of ant societies, which to me is really exciting. So ant colonies um, are not only organized in terms of allocation and division of labor, but they're organized spatially across the vertical strata of subterranean nests in most cases. So when you see an ant nest um, out in the forest or in the field, in this case on the cinder blanket in the Pinacate in Mexico <laughs> um, near a steam volcano, you see these little craters, which are the entrance holes of the nest and the soil which has been brought out by workers. Beneath the surface, there's usually a elaborate nest which has been excavated and has a species typical shape. Within that nest, the ants are organized by age so that the young ones are at the bottom and the old ones are at the top. And the way that they determine who can come into that nest, their special home, is through a process of chemical discrimination. So ants recognize each other by colony specific odors, which come in the form of waxes on their surface, okay? And inside the nest, all of the food the colony needs is stored, all of the brood or baby ants are reared, and a division of labor plays out across this vertical space. When we compare ant nests across species, we can see this beautiful variation. Each of these ants represents the architecture of a different species, and species do have unique architectures. You can see that some are sort of um, extended or blown out, and others are really scrunched up and tiny. And so the way that these nests are structured actually is a function of the division of labor of the workers that excavate them, but it also tends to shape the collective behavior of the nest and the way labor can be sort of organized. Within each nest and across the vertical strata of the nest are, of course, these special creatures, which we like to call guests. They are, by and large, unwelcome guests, these myrmecophiles are really parasites that exploit the social food flow system of their host colonies. And they can enter that nest by breaking the chemical communication code that the ants use to recognize each other and that the ants use to um, unlock things like food sharing. So ants have sort of secret handshakes. Um, these are tactile codes um, that they sort of um, use during interactions to determine who to feed, who to care for, who to groom. And many, many creatures from different, really disparate taxa have broken that tactile code and the chemical code, which um, uh, allows ants to discriminate between foreign and uh, nestmate individuals, okay? So in the Sonoran Desert, where a lot of my work takes place, we can really um, see some clear examples on the surface of nests, not even inside, here pictured, you may be able to see a little spider running around among the ants. This is Septentrina bicalcarata. This is a um, parasitic spider, which lives in the nest with the ants, Pagonomerum expergosus, and actually eats ant brood. When the ants kind of come out to forage at night, sometimes the spiders get pushed out to the surface. If you'll notice, the ants are not really attacking the spider, and it's navigating this um, sort of a uh, mass of potentially really harmful stinging ants quite adeptly. So this is a true myrmecophile. It is adapted to life among these ants and life within the nest. Pretty fun to see. Here in Massachusetts, you can also see lots of sneaky spiders 
living with uh, things like chromatogaster, like the one we just saw. So here is Frorunellus, uh, this little spider that's crawling around. I'll play it one more time. And if you flip over any rock in any of the local forests around here, you're likely to find this ant, Chromatogaster cerasi, and this special little spider, which is also a brood parasite. I have a great interest in the diversity of behaviors and the diversity of taxa that sort of exploit ants and steal their stuff. And so I thought it would be fun to sort of just go through um, a number of different strategies these so-called mermecophiles employ in order to um, take advantage of ants and their um, elaborate societies. And so um, after that, I'll get into a little bit of my research, but to begin, I wanted to share with you some of the different ways that these mermecophiles um, sort of trick and hoodwink the ants that they live with. One of the main things um, mermecophiles do is steal vomit from the mouths of ants. So ants all have a social stomach that they, we call a crop, and that's where they store liquid food. So they go out into the forest, they um, tend aphids, and they fill their guts, their crops with honeydew. When they return to the nest, there are often little creatures waiting to gag them and steal as much food as they can through a process we call trophallaxis, mouth-to-mouth -mouth food sharing. Some are mechophiles, like these antenophorous mites, underneath the chins of each of these ants, take it a step further and they actually live on the bodies of the ants and simply tickle their mouth parts whenever they're hungry or want a meal. So here you can actually see on the bottom left, the two black laziest ants sharing liquid food mouth to mouth. Um, so this is food intended for nest mates. And there's a little mite in the middle interrupting that food sharing and, and, and taking its share. So some of these um, mermecophiles are sort of vomit foods, very cute. Others, like this caterpillar, Lifer brassilis, are predators of ant brood. And they have these fabulous defensive body types, uh, which in some ways look like the sole of a shoe. They've been described as creeping soles. And what this really is, is a caterpillar underneath a really thick sort of carapace um, that protects it from the bites and attacks of the ants that it is living with and feeding on. It cruises across the floors of brood chambers, almost like a Roomba vacuum cleaner, and just sucks up all of the ant larvae and pupae in its path. So it's eating baby ants. Um, and if we kind of pull the caterpillar up, we can see its sneaky little face. And if you flip on its back, it continues eating. You can see just how thick its body wall is and how impervious it is to the attacks of the ants. So this is a specially adapted body form. When the caterpillar pupates, it looks like a sort of rising loaf of bread. And this pupa is also unable to be accessed or opened by the ants. It's extremely tough. But the butterfly that emerges, which is a lysenid butterfly, which you call a, a moth butterfly in this case, um, is actually quite sensitive to the attacks of ants. So it actually has disposable scales on its wings, which it sheds as it runs out of the colony and as ants attack it. So this special butterfly is, um, has a really exciting moment in life when it comes out of the pupa and then has to flee outside of one of these weaver ant nests to escape with its life. If you think you have pest problems in your house, you're not alone. All ant colonies are plagued with miniaturized versions of the same pest that we have. Here I'm showing two of the world's smallest cockroaches. These are in the genus Adaphila. And they are riding on an alate or a winged queen of a leafcutter ant. So um, these special roaches will board queens and males during mating flights, and they will disperse to new locations by jumping off of these uh, winged individuals when they land in this place where they'll dig their new nest. Roaches aren't the only things that ride leafcutter ant queens. Leafcutter ant queens are enormous. They make a really good, you know, huge cargo plane. So spiders also like to ride them. This is a, a spider in the genus Atacobius, and it is riding on a queen ant. Now these spiders do not stay on their, uh, their little portage all the way to its destination. In fact, when these queens fly through the air looking for a place to settle and start a new nest, the spider actually jumps off midair amidst a piece of silk and balloons away across the forest canopy to find a brand new um, mature nest to invade, okay? 
So this is how these special animals disperse. They disperse on the backs of the ants that they exploit. Once inside the nest, both the roaches and the spiders eat the food of the ants or the brood of the ants. Other types of myrmecophiles um, are ones that are found with ants, but it also look like ants. We call these special type of myrmecophiles myrmecomorphs. And in this case, you can see a really interesting hysterid beetle kind of in the midst of this army ant uh, raid, uh, just trotting along there with the ants. The ants don't seem to notice it. And in fact, ants don't really use vision to recognize friend from foe. The way that this beetle is uh, fitting into the ant colony must have something to do with the way that it smells or the way that it feels in order for it to fit in. But if you notice, the colors of this hysteric beetle very nicely match those of the army ants that it's running with. This selection on sort of uh, color matching is actually a form of Batesian mimicry, whereby an, uh, a harmless or defenseless <clears throat> animal mimics a well-defended or distasteful animal like the army ants and therefore avoids predation. So the selective agent which drives this color mimicry is actually something like a bird or a lizard and not the ants themselves. Um, Myrmecomorphy and Batesian mimicry are just prevalent across all types of, uh, all manner of arthropods that hang out with ants and is especially wonderful uh, within spiders, one of my favorite groups. So on the top here, I have two different ants. Um, one is a polyrachis, another colobopsis. This is actually an exploding ant. So very dangerous, not something that predators like to eat. But um, on the bottom, we have two spiders that look just like the ants above. So these are mimetic spiders that take on not only the body form of an ant by you know, um, increasing the apparent number of body segments they have, they'll actually change their first pair of legs into a false pair of antennae and wiggle them in front of their heads um, uh, to behaviorally mimic the ants as well. They mimic the ants walking tempo and also hang out in areas where the ants hang out. Um, and so by looking like an ant, they actually benefit um, from avoiding the predators that avoid ants. One of the most spectacular Batesian mimics of ants is this one, Myrmapalta platyliodes. And this is an Australian and Southeast Asian species of spider, um, which in the case of the male actually mimics two ants at once. This is a mimic of the weaver ants, Ecophila smargyna. And these Ecophila ants live in uh, sort of these leaf nests that they weave together with the silk of their larvae. They really sew. And uh, they move between these leaf nests and carry their younger sisters. So what this spider is essentially mimicking is the carrying behavior of the uh, ant that it resembles. So if you look at the back half of the spider, it's mimicking an ant, but the front half, the chelicerae, actually have eye spots and are presumed to mimic um, an ant that's being carried in the mouth of a sister. So these are two different color morphs of Myrmopalta. Um, in this case, the spider is mimicking an ant species which carries its siblings upside down. So here is like the presumed gaster of the second ant being mimicked by the chelicerae or mouth parts. And in this case, this species of ant um, that's being mimicked carries its nestmates pointing forward. So you have eyeballs on this end. It's really fabulous. Uh, <laughs> I just love it. One of my favorite Batesian mimics is this one on top here. Um, its body is not necessarily shaped like an ant, but its chelicerae have these bulbous, um, hairy protrusions at the end, which it claps together when threatened by predators to resemble the head of an ant, uh, this ant, diacama. So here's the ant, here's the spider, and as the spider goes about its day, it normally doesn't sort of look like an ant, only when it's threatened does it clap those chelicerae together and waggle its front pair of legs like a fake pair of antennae. So totally fabulous. So for those of you that are here to hear about birds, you may already be familiar with things like ant birds, uh, which are true parasites of ant colonies as uh, Peter Regg and others have shown. Um, they take some of the catch that army ants and things would normally eat, but there are actually many types of vertebrate myrmecophiles. Um, here pictured are a few of the birds and a few of the other characters. So, um, uh, Mecca is like this bicolored ant bird, and I think there's a barred wood creeper in here as well in the back. 
um, actually hang out around army ant colonies. There are many birds that do this. Some are facultative, some are obligate. And they eat the uh, insects which are pushed ahead of the advancing line of army ants and actually steal about, I think, 30% of the potential protein that the army ant colony itself could obtain if the birds were not there, okay? Other birds you may be familiar with um, perform a behavior called anting. Many of you probably have seen this. Turkeys do it, lots of grackles do it, many types of crows do this. Um, in the case of blue jays, uh, the birds, uh, these blue jays have been observed taking uh, ants in the genus Formica and before eating them, actually wiping them on their feathers. Many hypotheses have been proposed as to why the birds do this, but Tom Eisner showed definitively that this wiping behavior was actually disarming the formic acid producing glands of the uh, ants. And essentially the birds were using their feathers as a napkin before consuming the ant. Other birds, of course, roll in ant hills and in uh, lines of ants. And for this purpose, they prefer dolichoterine and formicine ants, which produce these really um, caustic and strong acids. They do not prefer to roll in the nests of stinging ants, which suggests that there may be some sort of function with respect to um, removal of parasites or um, even uh, having an effect on sort of molting seasonally. This has not been experimentally shown and in fact, all experiments which have attempted to show the effects of um, ant acids, <laughs> ant produced acids um, on um, feather parasites like mites or feather uh, fungi or diseases have failed to show that um, this anting behavior, the self anointing with the bodies of ants actually has a measurable effect. So the jury's still out on the function of self anointing with ants. Some have suggested it has an autoerotic function I think more experiments are needed. But if you ever see something like this, um, you can be sure that ants uh, and birds do have some pretty significant uh, and wonderful interactions and you may figure out why that is. Other vertebrates that can be found in ant colonies include uh, some very strange creatures. In one case, a Sembrankin eel was found in the bottom of a leaf cutter ant colony. Here, I'm showing you the tadpoles of a very special frog, which can spend its entire life inside the nests of ant colonies. And they even deposit their eggs and tadpoles there. And these sort of um, unpigmented, strange tadpoles develop several meters below the ground in the waterlogged bottom chambers of these giant leafcutter ant nests. Here, you can see one of the leafcutter ants, which shows no aggression towards the tadpoles. And as the frogs develop as adults, they happily call and attract mates into the actual ant nests, although they are surrounded by these otherwise aggressive ants. So some experiments have been done that suggest the, um, the frogs eat specific bugs and other things that allow them to secrete a substance which is repellent to the, the ants that they live with. Here's another favorite. This is Antis baena alba. This is a legless lizard also lives with leafcutter ant colonies. You can find these in Central and South America. And it's named for this um, Greek, uh, cr a creature of Greek mythology, a monster really, which is a, a two-headed serpent called the mother of ants. It's really the best genus name that you can think of. Um, but unlike its moniker, this is not a terrible creature. It's a, a gentle creature that follows uh, the scent trails of ants. It can orient using the foraging pheromone trails of the ants that it visits. And once inside the nest, it feeds on a rhinoceros beetle, which is a parasite of the fungus gardens of the ants. So in some ways, one might consider this special legless lizard to be something of a mutualist, but it is a myrmecophile nonetheless. Many blind snakes can be found within the nests of ants. In fact, in Arizona, you can find quite a few of blind snakes following army ant trails. Others live inside the fungus gardens of ants like after stigma, fungus gardening ants. And here you can see that some uh, snakes like this blind snake actually deposit their eggs inside the fungus garden grown by ants for food. So ants collect things like caterpillar frass or um, sometimes leaves, of course, and then they grow a nutritious fungus that they eat. The fungus is protected by a, a suite of other um, bacteria and uh, that the ants cultivate on their bodies and makes an excellent place, a very well protected place to rear their offspring. 
The snakes take advantage of this special microclimate and uh, sort of sterile environment and place their eggs there. The ants don't seem to mind and they build their gardens happily around the snake eggs, which uh, once the eggs hatch, the snakes leave to find a mate in a new nest. Thank you. Okay, so that's a little bit of an overview about some of the different kinds of myrmecophiles we have and the ways they exploit ants. But I want to talk more about where you can find myrmecophiles across the vertical strata of a nest and perhaps how um, sort of these special myrmecophiles, which invade the deepest parts of the nest where the ants brood or kept, um, might have evolved. So, as ants age, as I mentioned, they um, they're sort of come out of their pupa and they're born usually at the bottom of the nest there. They are with their queen. And um, as they age, they change jobs. We call this age polyethism. So there's a relationship between the developmental age of the ant and the task that it does. As they age, they also move up in space until they become foragers and leave the nest to collect food and bring it back. Foragers are the only ones that really leave and go far away and they die doing that job. It's the last job that an ant will do. So there's this behavioral division of labor that's spread across um, a vertical space. And there's different things happening at those different depths in ant nests. So here um, I'm showing you the work that some work I did with Bert Holdabler on this uh, beetle, which we call a highwayman beetle. It is a parasite of ant foraging trails. And so it doesn't live inside the nest, but actually just outside of it. And what it does is it approaches uh, foragers that have crops full of honeydew and sort of liquid food. And it just sort of robs them right there on the foraging trail. It comes up and it solicits uh, feeding by stimulating the ant's mouth parts, kind of shoving itself into them and really stimulating that gag reflex, which releases the food in the ant's social stomach. Okay, so you can see it. <laughs> it's very pleased with itself. Let's watch it again. It's very pleased with itself. I like its big ants. <clears throat> so for those of you that are entomology nerds, this is a nitidulid. This is a, a, a sap beetle, right? And so one could imagine um, that a sap beetle that was feeding on sap or nectar may have encountered these trails of ants heading to fields where aphids were um, being tended and sort of thought, maybe I can interrupt these ants. <laughs> um, so it's, it's actually a specially evolved parasite. Another type of parasite um, can be found a little closer to, within the nest. These are um, Aleocarine staphylinid beetles. This is Dinarda dentata. This is a European species. And it exploits a number of different ants, but uh, including the ones exploited by Amphodes marginata, uh, which I just mentioned. But this one is found in the uppermost chambers of ant nests where it occurs. So it's found in these sort of peripheral subsurface chambers right there at the top. And in these chambers, uh, ants actually tend to deposit their trash. Um, so those young ants, which are cleaning up the nest, deposit their trash up there. And then the older workers take it out to throw it away. We've all seen corpse piles and trash piles made by ants. Well, it comes out in a, a, a series of sort of steps, right? It's not just brought out by a single ant. You can see this Dinarda beetle is actually feeding on the corpse of one of these um, ants that has died and is in the trash chamber waiting to be exported uh, to the morgue, <laughs> sort of. So these little beetles are exploiting these peripheral trash chambers and that's really by and large where they're found. Interestingly, the way that these beetles make their living in the nest has something to do with their ability to live among the ants, right? All Aleocarine staphylinids have really well-developed defensive glands, which um, sort of uh, produce distasteful or, or harmful or bad smelling chemicals, which can dissuade other insects from eating them. But in the case of um, this Dinarda beetle, its defensive glands have sort of been co-opted into an appeasement gland. So these special glands produce attractive substances, which the ants actually really like to lick. And when an ant is acting aggressively towards a beetle, it will present these glands to the ant in order to appease it. Many different myrmecophiles have specialized uh, glandular structures and glandular openings and morphologies, which allow them to disperse and distribute these appeasement substances which are really just sort of uh, secretions from inside their body. These are exocrine, exocrine gland openings. Okay, so here's some of the cool structures that different things have. I think this is like a tentacular organ of a, a, um, a Lycina butterfly caterpillar that lives with, with, um, with ants. A third uh, 
third type of uh, aleocrine staphylinid myrmecophile is Loma Hussoides strumosis. And this is one that um, not only produces uh, appeasement secretions when it's sort of threatened by an ant, but it actually does something even more spectacular. It is essentially adopted by the ants and carried down into the brood chambers of the nest where it lays its own eggs and deposits its own brood and solicits mouth to mouth food sharing from its hosts. So in order to initiate this adoption process, the beetle actually uses uh, several different adoption secretions and adoption structures to get the ants to uh, do its bidding as it were. So the first thing that the beetle does is present these like hairy patches on its elbows. And um, these groups of CT are um, sort of attached to glandular openings and they produce um, a secretion which the ants find attractive. Once this sort of primer secretion is consumed and imbibed by the ant, as you can see here, the elbows are licked, then the, um, then the beetle presents these sort of special trichomes or these hairy patches on its abdomen to the ants. And you can look in this histological section and see the glands that are down beneath these hairs. Um, and these patches produce a different secretion, which stimulates the ant to pick up the beetle and carry it down into the brood chambers. So these sort of secretions are thought to mimic sort of the uh, sort of mimic the brood of ants, the larvae and pupae of ants, uh, which are also carried by workers in the same way. Okay, so once in the brood chambers, the beetles can deposit their own brood, which will be fed directly by the ants. But the beetles then uh, solicit mouth-to-mouth -mouth regurgitation from the ants themselves. Um, all the while mimicking the sort of the tactile signals of uh, ant larvae. This is really a larva mimic. Um, beetles will sometimes try and steal food from each other, but it simply doesn't work. They only take, they take, take, take. And once a beetle has been adopted, the colony really treats it as a colony member. And you can sort of uh, pair together familiar and unfamiliar beetles with ants and see how much food the ants are willing to share with those beetles. And you can see by and large, um, they only will share food with beetles that have been formally adopted. Okay, so those are some of the ways that the beetles sort of exploit different spatial areas in the ant nest and on the ant foraging trail. You can see how uh, over evolutionary time, perhaps a, a beetle that initially was a foraging trail um, exploiter might become a uh, trash pile exploiter and might sort of uh, make its way down into the heart of the nest. But how else do myrmecophiles exploit division of labor within ant colonies? To tell this story, I have to tell a human story first. So um, during my graduate work, I was um, working on the Florida harvester ants down in Florida in the Apalachicola National Forest. And um, myself and my PhD advisor, Walter Chinko, were approached by Jim Dunbar and Jack Rink, uh, archaeologist and a geochronologist. And they wanted to um, figure out if ants could be disturbing the, uh, uh, the distribution of soil particles below the ground. Um, which could affect something we call quartz clock aging or optically stimulated luminescence dating. It's a way that geochronologists can age cultural artifacts based on quartz grains that are found in the same, uh, you know, subterranean layer as these sort of uh, uh, archaeological objects, right? So it's a way to age things when you just have quartz, okay? And so we thought, you know, um, these Whedon Island cultural artifacts, like these pottery sherds, were supposed to be from the pre-Clovis period, but they were aging in sort of tens of thousands of years older than that. Um, and they didn't really um, jive with what we thought about um, people crossing the Bering Strait and when that might have happened, right? So could ants be ruining optically stimulated luminescence dating and affecting the way that we perceive the age of cultural artifacts? To answer this question, um, we had to dig up some ant colonies and then uh, come up with a, a way to determine if they were mixing sand below the surface. Um, so here I am digging up the ant colony, which is the focus of this study. And what we did once we got the hole dug was hire a carpenter <laughs> and have them build this two meter deep box. Inside the box, we actually made a layer cake of different colored sand. So here on the right, you can see the colors of sand and the depths at which we layered those sands. 
we wanted to do this because it's impossible to sell sand particles apart just by looking at them. And in order to determine if sand from a lower layer was deposited at a higher layer without coming to the surface, we had to be able to recognize it visually by, by color. So we built this layer cake of sand under the ground, and then we planted a harvester ant colony on top of it in a little enclosure. And we asked the harvester ant colony to dig a nest there over a period of seven months. What we found was that when we dug up the ant colony and we looked at the chambers under the ground, we saw this extraordinary mixing of different colored particles coming from different layers. What we really saw was that the ants were moving sand up in a series of steps. No one ant was digging up sand at two meters and then bringing it all the way to the surface. Those ants were digging it up, depositing it 20 centimeters higher, and another ant would reform a new bolus of sand, bring it a little higher until it finally made it to the surface. This was really exciting because it meant that the ants were dropping sand from lower depths and bringing it to higher depths. And sometimes those pieces of sand did not make it all the way to the surface. We could see the mixedness of the boluses of sand that came out on the surface, which was really pretty. And it sort of proved our point that the ants um, could be dropping off or uh, not taking all of the sand from a lower layer up to a higher layer. This would then cause misaging of things like pottery sherds, which were in a layer where ants had um, deposited uh, sand from down below. This all hinges on the fact that the quartz clock is reset when, it, uh, when sunlight hits it. So if sand is moved underground, that clock keeps going, okay? So in all, for a single ant colony, we, we were able to find about 16,000 grains of sand in layers where they did not belong suggesting that the ants were um, messing up OLS dating with their sort of division of labor or sequential caching behavior. So what does this have to do with myrmecophile, right? What does this have to do with anything? Well, as the ants move sand up in a series of caching steps, we also found that they move seeds, which they eat, and insect prey, which they eat, down in a series of caching steps. So you can spray paint some seeds and offer them to an ant colony, you know, a day, two days, or 45 minutes before you excavate it, and you really track the progress of those differently uh, dyed seeds with respect to the time that they were offered. So when you excavate a nest, you can find exactly where those seeds are and track their progress in vertical space. What we found was, what we sort of assumed, um, is that the foragers drop off insects and seeds at the top of the nest, and then other groups of workers pick them up, bring them down, another group of workers pick them up and bring them all the way down to storage. So there's a true sort of um, vertical division of labor in these ant colonies. Now, how do myrmecophiles come into play here? If you notice here in this illustration, which I did a while ago, there are some little interlopers there at the top of the nest. This is actually a new species of beetle that I found, um, which exploits the sequential caching behavior of the ants. And so if you offer colonies um, internally dyed seeds or insect protein, you can actually see that these beetle larvae, which dig tunnels that sort of intersect the ant uh, chambers, uh, will steal about 87% of the insect protein that these colonies bring in. So they're really good parasites. When the beetle larvae are absent, so in unparasitized colonies, um, the ant larvae, of course, get 100% of the insect protein that's brought in and intended for them. So these sneaky little parasites um, have their full developmental sequence right there at the top of the ant nest, and they're exploiting that special division of labor that the ants have where foragers deposit food in the top of the nest without bringing it all the way down. When these beetles pupate um, and come out of their pupa, actually, they release this, uh, this cloud of stinky quinones and uh, run out of the nest to avoid attack by the ants. Um, so here's one that I got. <laughs> so these harvester ants um, divide labor in another really interesting way, which I thought I'd mention. And, and um, for instance, if we look at allocation to foraging over an annual cycle, you can see that there's this proportional change uh, across you know, four consecutive years that's pretty similar, right? This is all mediated by the age of workers in the nest. So I told you this is age-based division of labor. You can actually track the rate at which ants age 
by digging up colonies and placing little uh, 38 gauge copper telephone wire belts on the waist of the ants. So this red belt was very much autumn 2012. And um, when you dig up the nest, the ants come in different colors. The young ones are light, the old ones are dark, and we can give them differently colored belts and then plant them back in the field by making nests out of ice and uh, returning the ants to their exact territory, then determining when they come up um, as foragers. So what we actually did was make these um, copper ice scoop trays in the shape of ant chambers. And um, we could you know, excavate a colony and then recreate the exact distribution and shape of the chambers below the ground and allow that ice nest to melt, which then made a facsimile cavity, which was identical to the nest that the ants came from. And if you don't believe me, have a look at this cast in the center of a natural Pagonomyrmex nest, and then have a look at these two varieties of ice nests that um, I created as a human um, in order to re-release the ants into the field without um, having them go to the trouble of digging their own nest, right? So these are casts. So once the ants were in the ground, we could just monitor them on the surface and track the colors of the belts that were appearing in the forager population, which is that final job that ants do. And essentially what we found is that there were two development rates in the nest. And these development rates had to do everything to do with the diet that the ants obtained. So ants in early June and July had a really protein biased diet. They were eating a lot of insects and they developed really rapidly, becoming foragers after just 43 days of age. So they accelerated through that sequence of jobs to become foragers very young. In contrast, ants that ate a lot of seeds in August, September, and October actually had a really slow development rate and became foragers after sometimes more than 280 days of age. It was sort of this confluence of differently aged workers which produced that really interesting pattern of forager allocation that we saw across the annual cycle. And in fact, the greatest allocation to foraging um, sort of uh, was met by the production of sexuals and sort of this high demand for foraging um, even though we couldn't affect um, behavioral flexibility in real time. It was strictly developmental. Okay, maybe too much about ants. <laughs> Let's return to their guests. So what can ants do to keep some of those naughty parasites away, these little beetles and um, tricky crickets and things? Well, on the mountaintop where I met Lynn, she probably recognizes this up near Barfoot Park in uh, Southern Arizona. I found a, a new species of ant. There's a species in the genus Myrmica. And this ant is actually harvesting ponderosa pine resin. Okay, so here's sort of a sagittal section of uh, one of these really shallow ant nests. They're about this deep. And you can see this collection of pine resin, which absolutely fills the nest. Here's a look at the top of the nest. It's also just spattered with balls of pine resin harvested you know, from the bases of these pine trees. And here's a, a picture of an ant with its lovely collection. So my question was, what is the function of this pine resin? And in fact, these ants also collect lots of lichen. What was the function of collecting lichen? Were these ants eating this stuff? Like what, what are they doing with it? Here's a chromatogaster ant, a different genus collecting lichen. Lots of ants seem to do this. In fact, in the nests of the, the myrmica, which I described, uh, they seem to make a strange brew. They actually mix together lichen and pine resin and they spread it and smear it all over their nest chambers. You can see little bits of the green lichen kind of clearly here. They tend to put it in a couple, like some layers. Here we are looking down on one of the chambers. You can see it absolutely looks like it's been powdered with powdered sugar. But these are in fact little tiles, a little mosaic of resin chips. I don't know what they represent to the ants, but I was really curious about their true function, right? Is it just decorating or is it something else? There's only one other ant species that collects pine resin. That's Formica paralegubris, it's from Europe. They diverged from this lineage of ants about 110 million years ago. So this seems to be an independent origin of this resin gathering behavior. And in the case of Formica, the resin suppresses the growth of pathogenic fungi and bacteria. It acts as really a prophylactic. And so um, we think perhaps the resin could have that same function for these ants, but it might also increase the structural integrity of nests. 
Um, so when you dig up the nest, they stay really together in one big chunk because the resin is quite sticky. Um, here's a picture of an area adjacent to a nest. It's a little hard to get oriented, but it's covered in fungus and mold. And so in the absence of pine resin, this is what the ground looks like. So maybe some, some hypotheses to test there. But the first hypothesis for the function of resin that I tested was that resin could actually be a form of pest control. When you open up an ant nest, it absolutely reeks of terpenes. It smells just like pine saw, okay? And um, in fact, when we look at whether or not things like thief ants, which are predators of the brood of things like Myrmica, actually um, would choose to nest in a place where this pine resin is, we can do these simple little choice experiments where we offer them a little dirt cup with, uh, with pine resin and without on one half, and then see where they dig their nest. We see that these um, little predators, the thief ants, never build their uh, nests on the side where the resin is. So it seems to prevent thief ants from invading the nest. We can do these sort of subterranean choice tests as well by placing just a little disc of resin and seeing which side of this kind of little subterranean maze the thief ants choose. And they never choose the side with the resin. They hate it. Guess who else hates it? Ant crickets, my favorite. These little, uh, these little guys absolutely hate the pine resin. And so they don't invade the nest. So it suggests that the use of pine resin may actually um, be a form of pest control because these colonies are really plagued by all these parasites that eat their babies. But, oh yeah, there's the names of the things. But lest you think these ants are free of parasites, while digging up these colonies last summer, I found a Lycina butterfly caterpillar curled up inside the, these Myrmica nests. These are quite common inside the nests. Don't know yet what species of Lycina these are, um, but this little caterpillar, when it pupated, made a pupil case of silk and pine resin. So it seems to be sort of benefiting from the resin collection uh, of the ants. And um, we don't know if it's a parasite, mutualist, or predator, but um, it doesn't seem bothered by it in the least. Here it is taking a little kippy on top of a pile of resin. So I'm running kind of short on time, but I think I will just um, mention that on an annual scale, ant colonies are faced with sort of a production problem that's rather interesting. In order to reproduce, which is the quote unquote goal of every colony, workers need sort of a, a minimum number of colonies need sort of a minimum number of workers. So for the Florida harvester ant here, um, colonies need 700 workers in, in order to produce new queens and males that are the fitness or the reproductive success of the colony. So in order to maintain their size and actually to grow and reproduce more, they have to be able to replace all of the workers that die during the annual cycle. And as we just learned, foragers don't last very long, right? It's the last job they do and sometimes they only do it for about 18 days, okay? So how do colonies maintain their size and how do they grow? If we're looking at um, one of my favorite desert species, Veramester pagandii, we can actually estimate the turnover rate of the forager population by just simply doing a mark recapture on foragers from individual nests. So we can catch them, count them with the help of undergraduates like Yosha, and mark them, release them, recapture them. And in doing so, you can get an estimate of the population belonging to that group of foragers in, in each of many colonies. So when you do that, you can uh, see just how many foragers colonies are placing into the desert each year. And on an annual scale, how many workers total a colony produces. What we find is that the most productive colonies dominate the largest territories. So for instance, if we're looking at, oops, forager um, number on the y-axis here, we can see that the blue colony, which has the greatest allocation for foraging in the summer, has one of the largest territories. Compare that to the orange colony, which doesn't have many foragers and is quite puny. So why are some colonies bigger than others? Could it be the cost of myrmecophiles? Could it be something else? What we actually find is that colonies with uh, just a few foragers, so a low forager number, actually produce large foragers. They produce a lot of large body workers. Whereas colonies with large territories and lots of workers actually produce lots of workers by producing tiny workers. 
So across the annual cycle, these very productive colonies shift the size of workers they produce in order to produce more. If you have more bodies, even if they're tiny, they can dominate and defend more territory and forage at greater distances. So there seems to be a strong advantage of producing tiny workers. So why would colonies produce large workers at all? That could be our question, right? There's a trade-off between worker number and worker size. And if bigger territories are better, why produce big workers? Um, one uh, thing that comes to mind is the fact that um, the nest is an adaptive structure, as we talked about, and has a function. And um, we can think about the way that differently sized workers contribute to the excavation or construction of this doohickey. So here in the Mojave Desert, um, Verimesa perganii digs nests that look like this. They're absolutely crazy. And it um, moves its nest quite frequently. Different colonies produce worker size distributions that vary across the annual cycle. So I wanted to know how these differences in worker body size would affect that wild structure, right? So how does a mix of large and small workers affect this thing? So what I did was I took this question to the lab and made some simple um, buckets full of ants. In one third of my buckets, I had uh, these groups of large workers alone from Verimesser colonies. Another um, sort of treatment, I had just small workers. And a third treatment, I had a mix of large and small workers. And I just wanted to see what the nest they look like built. I just wanted to see. So what I actually found was that um, small workers over 48 hours excavate a very small nest. But so do large workers. 60 ants can't do much over 48 hours. This is my living room, by the way. <laughs> it was a rental. And so... <laughs> And so the expected size of a nest that uh, 30 large and 30 small workers would produce is about you know, that big. That's the expected one with the blue slash through it. But what you actually see is that when you put workers of two sizes together, they make a much larger structure, a much deeper nest. And so what does this mean? This means that the interactions of differently sized workers actually yields an emergent or colony level trait that's not predicted from the sum of its parts. This is an, a non-additive or um, sort of an extra property of cooperation between differently sized workers. And in fact, these um, differently sized workers when cooperating not only produce deeper nests, which you know, are more voluminous, but they produce more complex nests. And this is something that's important in the desert where you need to get underground and get your whole colony moved rapidly before you dry out. So there may be some adaptive function to producing large workers. What else might large workers do that small workers do not? When we think about ants, we often think of like a soldier cast, right? And in fact, um, these ants, Verimester pergandii, are plagued by an enormous number of spider species that like to feed on them. Colonies release a single foraging trail each morning. It's like a black ribbon that extends across the desert. And all along that foraging route, little spiders are camped waiting to eat those ants. Some of my favorite are in the uh, general Asagina and Steatota. These are the false widow spiders. And they just set up these little trap webs along the uh, foraging routes of the ants. Here you can see some ants captured in webs and some very concerned sisters, not sure what to do. But when we look at the reactions of large versus small workers to nestmates trapped in spider webs, we can see something pretty interesting. Oh. How can I play this? There we go. It is only the large workers that actually know what to do when a sister is trapped in a spider web. And in fact, they will rescue sisters from spider webs. This is a new third context of rescue behavior in ants. Ants are known to rescue nestmates from antlion pits or from collapsed soil, but never before had anyone seen ants rescuing one another from spider webs. And so what's actually happening here is that the ant that's trapped in the spider web is releasing an alarm pheromone from her mandibular gland, so uh, sort of an odor, which calls in these large bodied workers and which does not stimulate small bodied workers to attend to her. Large bodied workers will come free her, drag her back to the nest and tear away all of her silk bindings until she's ready to forage again. It's pretty spectacular. 
But why would a would an ant forager invest in saving another ant? I mean, foragers in this species only live about 18 days after they start their foraging career. It's a very short tenure. Um, so why invest in saving a disposable ant? Well, the fact is, if spiders were to eat just five new foragers a day, and if foragers bring back two seeds a day, successfully bring back two seeds, and they have an 18-day foraging career, this would cost the colony about 65,000 seeds a year. So there, if we think about the cost-benefit analysis of investing in saving nest mates from spider webs, it really checks out. Um, by just saving five workers a day from these spiders, colonies can really um, protect their seed income, which is the way that they build new workers and build new queens and males, which are the ultimate goal of the ant colony factory, right? So I think I'm almost out of time here. And I will just mention that my real passion is these creatures, these ant crickets. Um, which are sort of barf thieves in many cases. They tickle ant mouth parts and steal regurgitated liquid. Now this poor, <laughs> dumb looking ant. <laughs> um, and these ant crickets are sort of interesting to me because they are a lot like uh, birds on islands. They've lost their wings. They produce enormous eggs, um, very few offspring, and they have these female biased uh, sex ratios, which are common features of some of our favorite birds that live on tiny islands, right? Um, so we can really think about the ways in which ant colonies act like islands separated in space and the ways in which little creatures like ant crickets who have lost their wings are the sort of under the selective forces uh, that are offered in these islands with limited resources. So my recent focus has been on the North American ant crickets, um, these special parasitic crickets, the only parasitic um, crickets or grasshoppers in the world. And um, the fact that um, uh, the crickets actually tend to be correlated in size with their hosts. So internal parasites typically are limited by the body size of their hosts because they have to fit inside. But there's not really any reason why a external myrmecophile like a cricket should be the size of an ant host. It's been suggested that these crickets actually mimic the gaster or the abdomen section of their um, ants that they live with. And just looking at it, you could see how tactily that might be the case. But I wanted to look closer at a generalist species, the desert ant cricket, Myrmecophilus mani, which actually has 46 different ant host species. This is a generalist myrmecophile that can live with almost any ant you put it with. And depending on the colony where it's raised, it reaches a different adult body size. So here's um, the relationship between ant size on the x axis and the relationship between cricket size on the y-axis. And you can see this really nice linear relationship. I'm gonna skip ahead in the interest of time and just say that um, crickets, uh, small and large crickets occur in the same uh, phylogenetic clade. This is a evolutionary tree that I made of these uh, crickets um, from Arizona and Mexico. And so body size of the crickets, which is, seems to be affected by uh, the hosts, is not something that um, we can see that causes these um, crickets to sort out into distinct species. And crickets from each of these clades or each of these sites also exploit multiple hosts. So this is sort of proof of concept. These crickets are phenotypically plastic. The host that they live with affects their body size, and they can essentially live with any host that they happen to come into contact with. The interesting thing is that depending on the host these crickets live with, they receive uh, really different diets. So this is a video of the Eastern ant cricket actually taken by a master student in my lab, Jen Ingram. You can see that these two ants are sharing food mouth to mouth, but this cricket is about to interrupt and steal a meal. Here it goes, very sneaky. This is the first and only video of the Eastern ant cricket um, feeding. So this is a really special finding for Jen. Um, but you can see how solicitous and, and interesting that cricket is. It's just really trying. The funny thing about these crickets is no matter how large they are, they all lay eggs that are the same size. So the very largest crickets on that graph lay eggs that are about 1.2 millimeters long. And the very smallest crickets on that graph also lay these giant eggs. When you swap the eggs between different host colonies, um, they will develop into differently sized crickets, independent of who their parents were or how big they were. 
And this sort of switch happens about the second instar, and then it's set into place, and they'll grow into a big cricket or a little cricket. But it sets up an interesting evolutionary question, which is that some female crickets have to invest a lot more body fat and a lot more of themselves into producing an egg of the right size than the large crickets do, right? The little one it has to do a lot more work to produce an egg that size than the big one. It's a lot like a kiwi bird, right? It gives everything it has. And so that means that some hosts are kind of better for the crickets because the crickets can grow larger there and save some of their body fat to invest in future uh, eggs and clutches, right? Those little ones sort of give everything they have. They only reproduce once because they put it all into that egg. So my sort of uh, final evolutionary question is, why do these crickets choose suboptimal hosts? Why haven't these crickets specialized on the hosts that are really good for them, that allow them to reproduce more and to grow larger? The answer to that may um, be that um, as crickets move between ant colonies, um, they follow these odor trails, but ant colonies are widely spaced in, uh, in any forest or desert, right? And so because these uh, crickets actually don't produce hydrocarbons, this waxy waterproofing layer, and um, they instead steal hydrocarbons from their host, they're especially prone to desiccation which means that as they disperse or leave the nest that they were born in, they may have to dive into the first colony that they find, even if it's a suboptimal colony in order to survive and have the possibility of reproducing, even if it's not the best colony. Here I'm showing the cuticle of um, an uh, ant cricket. It's covered in these sort of uh, scales. They look a lot like feathers, so you bird people might like them, but, um, they these are actually thought to hold on to the waxes or the hydrocarbons produced by the ants. These hydrocarbons are used by ants to determine who belongs in the colony and who is a foreign individual. So when the ant when the ant crickets get to a new colony, like many other myrmecophiles, they likely um, groom the ants and then anoint themselves with that hydrocarbon lotion in order to uh, chemically fit in or be in disguise. So if you like these stories, um, I am going to shamelessly plug a book that I just wrote with Bert Holdobler on the subject. It's 576 pages of Myrmecophile tales, and it's richly illustrated with more than 200 um, color plates. And it talks about things as small as bacteria and fun fungi, all the way up to our vertebrate Myrmecophile friends. And it really is uh, a labor of love because these uh, creatures are so, so delightful. Um, so with that, I will thank you for your attention and uh, welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Who would be choosing to see this study somewhere other than where you were saying? Would it produce different results? Yes. So, you know. The ant species are not. So, uh, the question was if I were to do my studies somewhere other than Arizona, would I find different results? And so, some of the studies I showed you were from Massachusetts, some from Florida, some from Arizona. But the interesting thing to remember is that the ants in each of those places are different species. And so, um, each of these ant species has these specific parasites. And so, the relationships are quite specific. But um, sort of globally, these strategies of um, stealing mouth-to-mouth -mouth food or eating brood or producing appeasement or adoption compounds have evolved repeatedly in different lineages. And um, we have good evidence of that from other researchers too. Yeah, good question. How long does an ant live? That's a great question. So in the case of the Florida harvester ant, some live as long as 280 days if they're a worker, some just 43 days. In contrast, the queens can live 20 years or so. This is a pretty interesting thing because both queens and workers are females that essentially come from the same genotype, the same genetic material. The only thing different about them is what they were fed when they were larvae, like that caterpillar stage. So you can take the same genotype and produce these two phenotypes or these two different casts 
one that's short lived and one that's super long lived just by early life nutrition. And that's one of the sort of great puzzles that a lot of people interested in ant development are working on. Oh, thank you, Maria. Please do contact me. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Yeah. I think some have been clocked at 30 years, but yes, queens always live longer than workers. Um, fire ant queens like Solenopsis invicta, for instance, they live about six years and they only really, um, the colonies in that case only really fail because the queens actually run out of stored sperm. So queens mate once in their life, either with one or multiple males, and then they store those gametes for the whole many decades that they live. So they have a little special organ where they store the male gametes. And if they run out, then the colony runs out and they're put. <laughs> uh, does the nest morphology, uh, oops, does the nest morphology of a species change in different soils? Why, yes, it does. So if you take the Florida harvester ant, which builds that most deep and elaborate nest I showed you, um, and it builds that in um, the um, sort of uh, longleaf pine forests of Florida, which have the sandy, well-drained soil, the nest looks just like the one I showed you. But if they dig that nest in the flat woods, where the water table is a little closer to the surface, the nest gets scrunched up. If they are forced to dig a nest in clay, the nest is even more scrunched up. So they are limited by the substrate. So there's sort of this intrinsic blueprint that the ants have, but then it's also affected by extrinsic things like water temperature, soil, uh, season. So yeah, it's not just the ants, the, the environment also matters. Great question. All right, well, thank you, Christina. My pleasure, thank you. <laughs> In turn, let's check around and ask any other questions that uh, didn't come up then. Yeah, it's just, it's just, uh, so beautiful.